Hello, Hive Nation. Welcome back to the Hive Nation podcast. Each week, we have leading experts in personal and professional development share their journeys and expertise to help you connect, engage, grow, and evolve. This episode of the Hive Nation podcast is sponsored by Lost River Distillery. Vodka crafted by hand, enjoyed by the best. Well, it, it, first and foremost, I always tell people, if you're going to challenge and if you're going to disagree, make sure you do that that with the, the facts, uh, that you are uh, greatly informed of the impacts and bring that to the table with your concerns. Uh, don't listen to social media. Don't listen to non-government organizations and activists. Take the best available information, which we have to do. And that's what you do is you present that information to the people and explain to them what the information entails in detail. Not the technical data, not all that stuff. We have experts for that. But explain to the grassroots people the impacts, both the good and the challenging when it comes to development, like any project. Uh, like if you think of a house, there's going to be an environmental impact when you're trying to lay foundation and pick a site. You put that into the context of something bigger, well, you, you scale it up 10 times the impact or a thousand times the impact. And you try to get to, under, get to the grassroots people to understand what their concerns are. So my advice would be is that if you're going to disagree disagree with uh, with the facts rather than a hearsay or some misinformation that's being proposed because there's an agenda behind it. I found that when we did our project, um, when we were proposing it, we proposed it in a way that where uh, community members could make an informed decision themselves. We didn't just do it once, not twice, not three times. I think we did it four times. And people will still always disagree, and that's okay. That's a part of democracy. Uh, but I think it's really key that the best available information, both the environmental assessment impacts as well as development and the longevity, which in our case was over 40 years, of what the remediation plan is going to be once that project comes to the end of its lifespan. And then what's next? Right. So I always tell people that when these projects are being proposed, uh, you need to understand we need to think seven generations ahead. So even though you're proposing a significant amount of money to Indigenous people, it's always about the land and the resources to which they provide to our community. So when we're looking at a project, we're thinking of the social innovation perspective from Indigenous a concept which involves our culture, our community, the people, our language, our arts, our history. While you're incorporating the need to build a project, you need to sit down and chat with us to talk about how best we can incorporate both, both worlds. And I think that's something that we didn't do a very good job of at the first time uh, of trying to understand people's concerns because, you know, all of us, no matter who you are, when you have a chance to try to bring people out of poverty, sometimes you forget that you know it wasn't always just about the money, it's about the quality of life. But I don't know anybody that's living in poverty that is happy. And so I thought, well, you know, we got to help get our people out of poverty and get into meaningful jobs. And how best can we do that? Well, the best way we could do that is providing the best available information and show them what could be. Uh, but, you know, even though that project didn't go ahead, uh, I've noticed more of our people buying homes. You know, a lot of them got jobs of port related developments, whether it's with the coal terminal, which is called Trigon, which our communities of Luckle Ems and Malakala are part owner in. Uh, the Prince Hubert Port with DP World, the expansion there, Alta Gas, Pembina. Uh, there was a lot of other smaller scale projects that came after 
Pacific Northwest. And it, it's a very good thing to see when you grew up with, you know, with some of these individuals and both, both of us and our people have struggled uh, trying to make ends meet. And now to see them buying property and buying homes, even going to Disneyland, going to Mexico, or even going to Vancouver, anytime they want and feeling de dependent on themselves rather than being independent of a system that has failed us greatly. Yeah, uh, sure. So my first real professional job was, was in Spain for the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna. In other words, kind of a fishy business. Anyway, it was, <laughs> first, it was the first UN commission that was set up in Spain. And I got the job to actually be the mail clerk. But when I arrived there, I said, hey, wait a minute, you're hiring a statistician. I have a degree in stats. I can do that. So I became the statistician. And it was a really interesting learning experience because it was the first time I'd been out of North America. It was a completely different culture. I didn't speak any of the language at all. And uh, there were, everything was different for me. And I looked at it and said, well, you know, get on board and do it. So I stayed almost three years and, uh, I was, um, a lot of what I did was kind of developing uh, statistical systems, uh, which was, may sound like a simple thing to do, but if you've got one nation that's counting the number of tuna and another the, you know, number of boats and another the weight, it's kind of like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta make it all consistent here. So that kind of, it was a very pivotal piece of professional experience because it was something I was able to, you know, bring through my work from, from then on. And uh, I've been able to maintain the language quite well. So uh, not only the language, but the culture. So doing work in South America or Mexico or other parts of the world, because of it being a UN commission, everything's done in French, Spanish, and English. So the language came reasonably easy. But, you know, Spain's a jumping off point for visiting all of Europe. And our members, our member countries were from all the fishing, tuna fishing nations in the world. So there were, you know, exposure to a myriad of different cultures and people and, you know, kind of making those all work together. People or something. I think I actually have one of me with a blazer. And Are you DJ? No, I'm DJ, DJ, dude. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Of all trades. Well, I it's try, to, is, yeah, that, try to combine all my worlds together, right? So. Good for you. That's, that would be the tagline. Insurance, DJ, Skateboarding. Tony Hawk wannabe. <laughs> yeah, pretty much a wannabe, yeah. Adam oh, Thompson. Not as good as skateboarding. <laughs> not as successful. <laughs> Maybe I'm better at DJing. Uh, I don't know if I am or not, but. I've never seen Tony Hawk DJ, so. No, I think I got him on that one. <laughs> no, it's just about, again, like the, the passions and like, I've been always into music, right? So it was like forever, since I was like 13, I've been in bands. And then cool. got into my professional career and started working at the brokerage. And these guys were all magicians, so they're just like, "Hey, uh, come over. Uh, we're going to do a jam and this and that." And I'm this young kid, like I'm maybe 25, and I just started working at the firm. So then we got into it and actually like formed like a real band. And then the insurance institute reached out and said, "Hey, we're doing a battle of the bands. Do you guys want to put a band in?" So of course we put the band into this insurance institute thing it's insurance but we're in this band and we're playing like tragically hip and uh, tom petty and a whole bunch of fun things <laughs> so we did the the deal and uh it was a lot of fun like it really like brought us together as like a crew and everything else like that it was a big commitment to do the show so we did the show and it was great and then after at the end of it with the band kind of broke up because we started living our busy professional lives of course i got asked to come back and and be a judge for a couple of years after that right so this music and insurance thing was always kind of like lingering and uh once the band kind of broke up i didn't have any time really to like spend with the guys or really play so i could just do my own thing and that's where like djing really kind of started like i always kind of dj'd on the yeah. side and then kind of once i couldn't play guitar in a band anymore then i'm like i'm putting all this passion into this and so I started doing that and I wanted to get, you know, new DJ equipment, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the firm came to me and they said, well, you've been with us now for whatever it was. It was like more than five years. I think I got a five year 
anniversary gift and they're like we'll buy you anything you want kind of on amazon up to whatever 300 bucks so of course my wife's like i'm like i want this dj controller and she's like like no nah, like you don't we don't need that <laughs> and, you know and then okay so then the firm goes ahead i'm like hey can you get me this and so they, they got it for me and then of course it comes in and my wife's like what's what's the deal with this and i'm like no 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 it was the firm yeah. it was because my yeah. anniversary i did such a good job being an insurance broker that they they bought me this equipment that's awesome so then it kind of went from there and then all of a sudden i started really getting into it and just music and just like just spending a lot of time in my basement when i wasn't working and i was like my workstation set up and then it's like, okay, done my hour, two hours of work. Okay, time and then get it, open up the other laptop and get into this other thing. Nice. And then eventually over time, like I got asked to DJ like the company Christmas party. So I go in and I DJ the, the Christmas party and that kind of went. And then all this stuff was starting to happen. So I was insuring like um, real estate associations across the country. So I had like New Brunswick reach out to me like, hey, we would love you to come out. You can be a guest speaker here at the banquet or at the convention. Yeah. And then at the, the banquet, I was like, what are you guys doing for the banquet? They're like, we're putting on an iPod or whatever and just listening to the music. Well, I'm like, well, I'll bring my equipment and I'll just do it. And like, would you really do that? So like, are you joking? And I'm like, I'm actually not. Like, I actually would do it. Yeah, I want to do it, yeah. And so it was all scheduled. So that was lined up. And then, you know, I was going to headline the uh, Battle of the Bands Insurance Institute thing. I was going to ha have that all done. Uh, and then COVID hit. Oh, shit. And so this whole insurance DJ career was about to take off when I was in Calgary. And then, unfortunately, COVID kind of just stopped it. Of course, you know, fast forward three years, we've relocated here to Saskatoon. And now things are happening again. And even just the people that you kind of meet and associate yourself with, like, I do find people, do they want, you know, a good formal business relationship? Yeah, they do. But I think we're living our life here and I think most people want something a little bit more. They want an experience. They want, you know, emotion. They want dynamics in yeah. their life. And if music is one thing that brings them that and you can be the conveyor of it, then it's just that much more memorable. Mm -hmm. Right, so you're really building on experience. So, are you were you lead guitar or were you bass guitar? I was lead lead, lead guitar and singer. Nice, yeah. Mick so, Mars, love so, it. And played like bass and a little bit of drums. And so it was just a bunch of guys, and we just had fun and uh, played a lot. And because they were, you know, so much more experienced than I was and knew so much about music and everything else, they taught me so much and like broadened my horizons. And then, of course, even with those types of but people that you associate yourself with, you bring in other forms of experiences to them. It's just like life in general. Very cool. So I'm bringing all this like DJ stuff and then the next thing I know, my buddies are into it and you know, and it's just different things that kind of come into your world that you're like, I like this. I'm going to go mm -hmm. and pursue this. And when you can ever line it up where, you know, coming up here, we got a show uh, coming up for like a business networking event. So it's business networking, but I'm gonna go up there and play some music and everyone's kind of like looking at me, kind of like going, is this for real? Like, are you really <laughs> gonna do this? And when it has that type of reaction, then I typically know that I'm on the right path. Absolutely. I'm doing yeah. the right thing. Because just that in itself, even just me being on this podcast here today, like just being able to go and not only have the ability to do it, but then actually like execute on mm -hmm. it. It's that memorable experience that people go, what was this? this Okay, and this person works in insurance. Yeah, right. And yeah. they do this. Yeah. So it's about I think the people that we remember that come into our lives. Um, I think there's just different, you know, experiences that we can have with these people, and uh, I think it's just so such a part, a cool part of it. So we look and we define ourselves by our profession. Yeah, right. Very cool. But uh, I feel that any conversation, any any time that I'm gonna. Uh, spend with anyone in my life like it's got to be a two-way street man <laughs> like uh i i want to learn they should learn i want to feel good they should feel good i want to like i want i want to go on the full journey in the conversation you know so yeah. like dude i'd listen to you two uh way more than i'd listen to myself uh tell <laughs> <laughs> And well, vice versa, because I have to edit these and I listen to myself talk way too much. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> feel it. The thing about the that's, Hive Nation. That's why I'm doing live. Sorry, that's why I'm doing live chats. That's, oh, yeah. That's why I just do it live. Because, man, if I had to get into editing, you'd, you wouldn't hear anything. So, you know, I just put it out live and I just freaking own it. And I just 
commit to the process, knowing, knowing what I know about myself and just haven't done it too many times in too many other uh, areas in my life. If I just commit to the process, it'll all be good after about a year. And so I've just come out of that year now where I feel pretty good about it. So I'm glad I just kind of put my foot down and said, not no editing. It's going to be live. Like, let's just get after cool. it. Cool. Uh, can I ask you what Pathfinder is on your shirt? Yeah, sure. It's a, uh, it's military qualification. And uh, I, I just, I've been wearing this thing all day. I didn't wear, wear it especially for you guys. I didn't even shave. So, you know, uh, it's, I didn't uh, either. it's just what I've been scrubbing around in uh, today. It's a uh, military qualification uh, that is uh, quite difficult to ach- achieve uh, in the regular military. Uh, I got mine in 1987, and at the time it was 70 days long. Uh, every day was a work day, nonstop. Typically, each day you get, on average, three hours of sleep, um, generally about the equivalent of one meal per day. Uh, we were, it was, uh, it's uh, considered one of the hardest courses, uh, certainly in the Canadian Armed Forces and NATO. Um, it, uh, hellacious workloads um and relentless pace the tempo is just ridiculous um you know the uh rucksacks that we'd be uh uh carrying around mostly full of specialized equipment never less than 100 pounds uh and then on top of that you've got all your you know combat gear and etc so um really really hard uh course to uh qualify in uh, with lots of specialist skills involved. And again, it was 70 days. Um, it it was the time that I did it was in the Canadian Airborne Regiment. I was a member of two commando. And um, that, that course started with about 100 men, got whittled down to 50 men. And then we finished off with uh, 10 guys that year. Wow. wow. And that was all guys who showed up wanting to win. You know, that was all guys right out of the Canadian Airborne Regiment. They're all kind of jumpers. You had to be jump qualified uh, because, of course, uh, we had a boatload of missions. uh, All every, you know, we were jumping out of uh, CC 130s uh, at 0200 uh, 0200 hours uh, into cornfields and then, you know, navigating cross country for redonkulous distances with heinous uh, workloads. And I mean, it was just bang, 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 mission after mission. Uh, and uh, so lots of jumping, lots of, uh, lots of adversity, uh, as it were. What was the determining factor of the 10 versus the 100 that started? Mm, you know, that's a really um, good question. And it, it, there's a lot of factors that I could quickly point to. Uh, but uh, one thing, and and this is an unfair, this is not a judgment on anyone who didn't make it, because, of course, there were guys there that got injured. I mean, mm-hmm. I when I started the course, uh, I was this weight. When I finished the course, I was 25 pounds lighter, and, and I showed up with hardly any body fat on me. So I lost nearly 25 pounds of muscle over the course of 70 days. Oh, boy. Again, I mean, like... Uh, you know, in a in a 24-hour cycle, sometimes we'd be moving for 22 hours of that cycle. And uh, that cycle, I was doing it on on one MRE or one uh, one meal. And uh, so, you know, you're, you're, when I, we didn't think of uh, breakfast, lunches, or suppers. I mean, there's, there's no terms like that. You're always on, you're as tactical, always moving. And so food, food was consumed when you could consume food. And sometimes I think, man, I'm freak. I'm so freaking hungry right now. This is ridiculous. I'm going to treat myself to a package of, of sugar. Like that would be my meal was a, a little pack of, you know, that you get with your creamer. And your yeah, yeah. I bet it tastes and so good too. It was so, so good. And you know, like if I was going to get all crazy uh, and I wasn't drinking coffee at the time. So uh, you get your little package of granulated to coffee a little creamer and a little sugar. And you could like put those uh, three things together, fold over the the lid, then put it inside of your boonie hat. And as you were humping along, just sweating buckets, like it, it would kind of melt it. And it turns into what's called ranger candy. And so like you can take it out. It's pretty grody. I mean, listen, this, this, this is a family rated comment, so I'm not going to say anything more. Like you just got to get over it. You just got to eat it. And it's not bad. It's not bad. 
<laughs> it's all about perspective. It is it's all mindset, buddy. Wow. It's all mindset. Number one yeah. is is your is your courses designed around a uh, military or or a, a, a law enforcement theme? Like, mm-hmm. is it? Uh, do you do you play off of your experience within your law enforcement um, a career and make a course out of it into that? Yeah, it's it, it, it's a bit more complicated than that. So the answer to, to answer the question is like, no, it's not military or law enforcement centric. Although the, the majority of my experience in my 20 plus years in leadership were in the police force mm-hmm. and, and in the military. Uh, so it just so happened that my leadership experience was intensified on account of what the catastrophic consequences attach with not being a good leader can bring you know you if you work in in an office and your 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 leadership you know as leaves lots to be desired your team is strong you may you could go for 10 to 20 years before anybody notices you know kind of thing but when you're out there with a team and they're expecting you to make the right decisions on account of the the catastrophic consequences that could potentially be attached to the, the the failure of leadership they don't let you get away with anything so you, right. you you know you get that introspection. Now the course is very very interesting because my my I'm a big proponent of changing the mindset instead of teaching people skills because if the mindset is wrong then the skills that you teach are misinterpreted, and so now you're giving them the right skills but they don't apply it in the right context or in the right fashion or or simply don't understand you know, the depth of them, and yeah. so the course is mainly an introspective leader course and that's. That's exactly how I call it, the introspective leader course. And and the reason for this is instead of worrying about all the external factors that we are trying to control, we're going to bring all this back to ourselves as humans and as individuals and address some of the things and shortcomings that we have that make every situation easier. So the argument is always like, well, what if I have somebody that really doesn't buy in the thing? And well, if you make yourself the best communicator you can be, you have a lot less to worry about when it comes to getting buy in and those types of things. So acting on the premise that somehow you're a victim of everybody around you as a leader is 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 a is a common is a common theme. It is but certainly doesn't reflect reality doing. But, you know, approximately about four years ago, I was like my mental health was in the ditch pretty pretty bad and i was suffering a great deal with depression and anxiety and um you know like everyone else life happens and kicks you in the junk a little bit and you fall down and and trying to find ways to get back up and that's kind of what i was trying to do and i organically came to to running as a as a method or a tool to mm, help or manage my mental health and I didn't really know that's what I was doing when I started it, but it just so happened to do that because I started running during the pandemic and um, <clears throat> I was, you know, avid guy in the gym, you know, lifting weights and, and, and jujitsu regularly. And, you know, those things kind of got reduced. And at the time I was going through a divorce and that was kind of really messing with me. And then, work stuff and so all kinds of things were happening so you know it really laid the groundwork and set the table for me to figure out a way to kind of actually add some more tools to help myself so um yeah i started running and you know i guess the running piece you could say like yeah the physical aspect of it was very helpful and kind of keeping me occupied and and um staying healthy and whatnot but i think it also gave me a task and something to focus on and um, something to improve upon, right? Because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a type of guy who, um, when I get into something, I want to get better at it. And I kind of go all in with things. And for me, that's what it gave me. It gave me an opportunity to kind of dive deep. And now if it was just running a, a 5K or a 10K, you know, cool, whatever. But I think it really changes the game in terms of mental capacity and building resilience when you like really go to that extreme of physical um, capacity or physical um, output. And I think that's where you actually build the resilience, mental capacity, physical body all of the things that you would think that are associated to building it are from at least for me has been through that endeavor so like not like a one-off but the constant effort every single day of trying to push myself to 
push that envelope of performance. Whereas I'm not trying to just stay at a certain thing. I'm trying to see how much faster I can get, how much further I can go, how much more I can put on my plate. Mm -hmm. And naturally from a physical perspective that really puts a lot on you physically and when you're doing that physically it automatically pushes you mentally it's it's doing both at the same time you're not like isolating one like when people think oh you're doing something physical oh yeah you're just doing something physical no you're actually doing something mental at the same time uh, because you're negotiating versus with yourself when you're doing these things and you're having conversations and you're you know all these different things that are happening so for me, I found more ways to manage myself in those um, difficult uh, running endeavors. And, and and when I would be doing them, I would um, I think I'm be in the moment, like, so let's say 10 hours into a run or something like, you, you know, you're there, <laughs> you're doing the thing, right? And I don't know, man, for me, I would think a lot and I would find... A, I would just like I'm very introspective, so I like I just think about how to do things better while I'm even in that process. So I've been um, over the last few weeks, I've been speaking at some high schools and 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 speaking with some, you know, grade nine, ten, eleven, twelves, and speaking on goal setting and the importance of goal setting. And I think this kind of is you know good for this conversation as well because what I learned when I was kind of writing down what I would say to these high school kids. You know, setting a goal is great, but what I've realized through the setting a goal, you know, you set multiple goals as I have, and um, it's really not just setting a goal for me to achieve something, but it's really setting a goal for me to achieve something, for me to be better, and really for everyone around me to become better. Because what I've recognized is that, you know, yeah, I could set a goal, and if I was just doing it on my own, yeah, cool, whatever, I achieved the thing, but um what I'm really starting to recognize is like when you set a goal and you really get after that goal and you do your best and you try to achieve it um, on, on, on such a level that other people start seeing that and automatically you're actually um, impacting the people around you, not just yourself. So once I started really seeing that, I was trying to find ways to illustrate that to the kids mm-hmm. Yeah, man, you you know, you're setting a goal. It's not about, it's not just for you now because you're actually setting it for other people so that people can see, holy crap, man, I can do that. Mm-hmm. And so why that's so cool for me is um, I never thought in a million years I could do what I just did. So I'm kind of that, like, I'm, I'm like everybody else in the sense of I only just did achieve something from two years of really hard effort. And two years ago, I never thought in a million years, like I'd be, I'm you guys, like I'm like, it's just a matter of like somebody just saying, okay, every single day I'm going to do this thing and then I'm going to achieve it. So Mm -hmm. I think it's helpful to show people, Hey, proof's in the pudding, man. I just did it just like two, two minutes ago. (laughs) You can do the exact same thing. There you have it. Hive nation. There's just a small selection from the honey pot. This is unreleased green room gold. Jason and I have sat down with all of our guests before the podcast and had amazing conversations that have never been released. So we're going to start releasing them in episodes that we're calling The Honey Pot. So if you didn't hear your favorite guest in this edition, don't worry because we have more unreleased footage and audio for The Hive Nation coming out in the near future. Also stay tuned for more amazing guests that are new to the podcast coming up very soon we have an amazing lineup this spring and summer that's all for now hive nation we're out